You're watching the new Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation, or CNCF, hosts critical components of the global technology infrastructure. CNCF brings together the world's top developers, end users, and vendors, and runs the largest open source developer conferences. Back again in Chicago for a little discussion about Kubevert, which is now in its 1.1 release. Yep. It reached 1.0 about in July, was it in July? Reached the 1.0 release? It was uh, pretty close, like around pretty May. Right around that time yeah. frame? Yeah, late spring. It, right, and uh, so it's very, very new. And here to talk about it, I have Ladik Robinovsky, a senior principal software engineer, Red Hat, and Ryan Hollisey, a senior software engineer and technical lead at NVIDIA. Thanks for joining me Thank for you. a Thanks little for conversation. For so for, uh, for me and everyone else out there who may not be familiar with Kubert, can you just tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So Kubert is, a, is a, it's an extension to, um, uh, to Kubernetes uh, that allows uh, to use the same APIs as in Kubernetes um, to run virtual machines on, on, on Kubernetes. And um, yeah, we do this uh, by, extending the, uh, by extending the API server and uh, create uh, a VM, <coughs> VM object uh, that is later um, being understood by the API how to create virtual machines. So what was the problem that really came uh, forward over the past few years that led to Kubert's uh, development? Well, I think um, that the idea of a virtual machine it's been around for a long time. Yeah. And it's just one of those concepts that, I guess it never really goes away. It's like one of those yeah. critical infrastructure components that yeah. run times that is just going to be useful, whatever. Right. And what's interesting is that you look at Kubernetes, it didn't really have a concept of a virtual machine. But people like virtual machines. So, and people also like Kubernetes. And so really the concept is that, well, you can actually run virtual machines and and Kubernetes, and so that's kind of the that was kind of the idea that that, that it's been around like as as a, as a concept for a little while, and it's something that um, sort of carried over, like it's sort of the the new age of, of virtualization. We can run these things in in this kind of environment, in, in, in a cloud native environment, in Kubernetes. Some people wanted also to um, to move away from uh, their traditional virtualization into the cloud. But um, their applications didn't uh, didn't allow them to. Um, I mean, it, 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 the investment that they had to do uh, to in, into into these applications to be containerized is uh, is huge. So some of the applications can be easily containerized, but the other ones have to stay as a virtual machine. So Kubert provides a way to run both, uh, to have both worlds um, run. Uh, the newly updated uh, containers alongside with the uh, old uh, virtual machines that you were previously running in the, in the data center on one platform. And so there's a number of new uh, features, new updates in 1.1, yeah. and maybe we can go through a few of them. Uh, you have a memory hot plug, uh, and uh, some of the advantages of that uh, seem to be uh, Pass through, right? Uh, cloning. Yes. Streaming and allowing for more dynamic right. and flexible VM management without disruption. Would that be accurate to say? Yes, largely yes. I think um, some of these uh, features, they uh, um, these are not new features to um, to in the virtualization world. They they come from some of them coming from uh, um, the data center virtualization. And the fact that we are uh, now bringing this in, in this new release is uh, pointing to um, um, basically to the idea that uh, Kubert is, is, is very stable now. And this feature, uh, because we brought uh, these mature features uh, into the game now, we wanted to implement these features for a long time, but there were no um, 
we, could, we couldn't because of all kind of constraints. The, the, uh, the platform wasn't stable enough. But now it's a good time to bring these features uh, because everything else is, is very stable. So features like um, uh, memory hot plug and uh, vCPU hot plug, um, these uh, features, um, they are, uh, we, we implemented them uh, because previously uh, um, containers were assumed immutable in the OpenShift world, in the, sorry, in the uh, Kubernetes world. And, um, and now uh, we brought them because we have a path forward um, into implementing our own solution, but then later making sure that uh, these solutions uh, will become native to Kubernetes. Uh, pre uh, because Kubernetes is changing together with us, and uh, as it becomes more mature, uh, they also bring features uh, that allow uh, the mutability of, uh, of pods. So now we, bring, uh, we brought uh, this feature that is a, um, a Kubernetes implementation, but it has a pass forward to, to become cloud native. So how do you avoid issues like you know, cognitive overload for people who are using these technologies where this is a new complexity that they have to manage? When you're thinking about memory hot plugs, for example, you know, and dynamic, v, and dynamic VM allocation. I, I guess it, I mean, I mean there's, there's kind of, um, I mean, I guess the way I think about it is like that there's new complexities that come with adopting the new technology. I mean, there's certainly, but I guess like, you know, kind of what Vladik's saying is like, this idea, at least a lot of the concepts, those features you just mentioned, like these are things that like, They've been around a long time. People are super familiar with them. And really what Qbert has done is it's just taken that concept that has been around a long time and it's just made it available behind the Kubernetes API. So ultimately, like adopting these things, like it almost would feel like in a lot of cases, like if you're on your laptop, you've got Versh, you've got you start your virtual machine, you define your domain, and, and you do sorts of things, you edit it, maybe you do hot plug and stuff, things like that. It's it's a similar kind of look and feel, but now instead of using Versh on like your local client, you're actually going to go through an API, and so really you're 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 now onboarding is like okay, I just need to maybe learn a little bit of Kubernetes, which is just a little bit of gamble. It's like that that's what ends up being you know your onboarding for these things. It's just a different kind of a workflow, but of the same thing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the concepts are the same, and and you, what you would see is it's very familiar. There's a libvirt server, right? For example, it runs inside the pod. The, there's a QMU process, right? Like if you were to look inside the pod, it would look very similar as if you were to run a verse command on your laptop on a Linux box and you look at the process wow. tree. It looks very similar. And, and so like, if you were to translate the two worlds, it's actually not very different. Just now you have an API in front that's, that's Kubernetes. So like a lot of things at first, you know, there's that first climb over the hill, but once you get over that first hill, then you start to get an idea of really how this works, and then you, it becomes just something you want to use. Yeah, I think like I think the the adaptation comes when you look at the Kubernetes ecosystem and like this this paradigm of like a cloud native environment, a declarative API driven by imperative user input. Like these concepts, these core concepts and primitives behind Kubernetes, and those ideas are you'll see there's a bit of a learning curve there and understanding those things. But eventually, when you do grasp them you kind of will find that you're in familiar territory again. With, with Qvert, like you like your virtual machines, it's the same concepts will apply, the features we're now exposed, and just through a different way. And so, there's lots of other new um, updates to 1.1. I, I, borrowing from what coming, you know, your own uh, information on it, there's uh, common instance types. Mm -hmm. um, Avert C CTL imprints. Um, I think that's right. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. Um, you read uh, the SIG network. There's a redesign of the interface hot plug API. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you have improved performance. Um, I'd love to know how. Um, and uh, you know, I'm curious about. Um, why SIGSTORE added CDI volume popularities for PVCs. So just generally, if you could rank kind of those things, like, and think yeah. of what you think are most important in terms of 
Absolutely. So um, if we'll if we'll talk about the, um, um, the instance types. So instance types, it's a concept that uh, comes from uh, cloud providers. Um, it's as a, a Essentially, a concept that uh, that allows you to uh, kind of slice virtual machines according to sizes. Uh, so you would say that uh, yes, I want a virtual machine which is medium or a large virtual machine, and then you would have uh, um, the uh, the resources uh, accordingly to uh, to this like medium, uh, small, medium, large. So this is our way to um, to improve the uh, the user um, the user experience overall. Um, you know, in order to define a, a pod or a, a virtual machine, you need to write along YAMLs, YAML files describing all of this. And, and here you would just use an instance type that contains inside all the relevant information already. How do you start a, a high performance instance, which is a size medium? So, kind of, uh, kind of that, um, that way to, to improve uh, um, user experience. And then the other features, uh, for example, what uh, the network, uh, the network SIG did. And this is um, um, so. Besides improving how did they do uh, plug and unplug, one of the things that they did is that uh, um, they uh, separated some of the network bindings outside of the um, um, outside, like into outside repo. And that happened because uh, when we started the project, we started with small with a number of bindings. And network bindings, and um, as we grew, this number increased. And um, at some point, uh, each uh, each user wanted uh, his own binding, and uh, there were all kind of ideas what they want to use. So instead of uh, incorporating and uh, piling up all of these bindings, what we did is that we created a layer that is a pluggable layer, and then um, we separated all of these bindings into external repo to provide some kind of an ex uh, uh, reference architecture. So anyone who wants would create his own binding and then would use it with a pluggable, um, uh, pluggable interface. And when it comes to, um, to uh, data volumes, to the storage SIG that we spoke about, that's actually very interesting um, because uh, in the early days, um, in order to, to improve user experience um, uh, that is related to uh, how do you start a virtual machine with a certain image, um, what uh, what we had to come up with is a mechanism that would just you point to an image, and then that image will get uploaded into um, into a PVC, and then provided to a virtual machine to to boot from. So it's a kind of a pre-populate uh, the uh, <clears throat> the volumes for the virtual machine, uh, so the user won't have to deal with the, with all of this uh, complexity. Um, and um, uh, but we introduced it. Um, only part of Kubert and not a part of, uh, of Kubernetes. And our uh, philosophy was always to uh, uh, to create uh, to be as, as as native as possible to use to reuse any component that Kuber, uh, sorry that Kubernetes has. Um, so these uh, data volumes uh, influenced something in in, um, in Kubernetes, which uh, which they created um, a volume populators. And uh, now we can slowly deprecate uh, data volumes and, and use uh, native um, volume populators. You also um, have ARM64 support, correct? Yes. Why would you add ARM support? Uh, it's, I mean, it's an important feature. It's one of those things that I would say we really consider to be like one of those core things as a runtime you need. I mean. I know, like, um, like the ARM, the ARM team, the people that work uh, for at ARM, they they're obviously really uh, care about. It. And Nvidia, we we like it too. We care about it. I mean, I, I think like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like the community itself. I consider this one of those core features. I mean, Kubernetes added it for their runtimes. There's no reason why Kubernetes can't support it. It's one of those things you see a lot. If people want to run workloads. It's they want to run on ARM. There's this. It's a common use case. I think this is also, um, in addition to what Ryan says, is a, um, an attempt. There is a like a general attempt to minimize everything and to run like a, on the uh, on devices that are somewhere far, far uh, from a data center. So uh, ARMs allow that. So if you will be able to run Kubert on a very tiny, small device, it uh, it, it has a benefit yeah. as well. What do you see as 
what do you see as some of the uh, trade-offs that you have to make when you're thinking about release updates? And in particular, 1.1. Trade-offs, okay. Um, well, I was, uh, well, we could say, I was going to say, we, uh, you answered the question about the uh, scale of performance answer, so I was kind of yeah. trying to answer but, it in, yeah, in, let's uh, do that. in, in kind of that way. So like, um, it, with performance and, what, and the way we kind of we measure in uh, in Cuber, we actually have a, a SIG that's dedicated. It's called SIG Scale, and its 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 job is to advise about scale and performance in in Cuber. and particularly when when going about this, uh, we have to measure. It's, it's it's critical, and and sort of the the general philosophy behind this is that okay, well, we we want to figure out performance and, and scalability. We need to measure, but we also need to understand, like, once we're measuring, like, what it is we're reading and what are we're looking at. So, like, you could, you could ask me, like, Ryan, and, and for performance, how performant is, is Cubert? Like, if I wanted to launch, like, 100 VMIs, 100 virtual machines, how long would it take me? Is it 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever? It's a difficult question to answer. I'd respond to you with a bunch of questions, like, what's your storage look like? What kind of network devices are attaching? Are you attaching devices at all, GPUs, things like that? That kind of thing kind of leads to the point of like, okay, well, performance is rel is, is relative. relative. Yeah, it's very relative. It's like it's just our philosophy. And so so how do we measure this? Like we need to figure out a way to do this. And so our philosophy has been, okay, well, we can take a fixed set of variables, we can measure over time across releases, across pull requests, and establish the trends. And so that's what we've done. We've we've sort of over time we've measured this stuff and 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 that's sort of like how we look at things. We look at PRs and we say, okay, wait a second, this pull request has taken our trend line and the way we measure it seems to be less performant. And so we've actually come across a number of these things. And so sometimes like with these features, like we go back and we, we will you know, reorganize them, recreate them, maybe we don't do them or whatever it is. Um, we've come, come across numerous um, features that are, that are like that. And, and eventually what we do is like, um, you know, we measure and we, we try to establish that trend so it's always it's always going down. So um, so pretty much like um, like in some of the latest releases, um, you know, we've we've continued to see that that number go down. I mean, we've roughly like our P95 for, for performance and our fixed variable set of 100 virtual machines, it's it's about, a, uh, from we've gone from about over the last nine months, 30 seconds of runtime to get down to about 28 seconds. So. Good improvement that we've seen. Yeah, so we're seeing some some nice improvements. That's what we'd like to see. Still more work to do, but that's the direction we want to go. Just in conclusion, what do we expect to see in 1.2 in the later releases? I think um, at least one of the things I'm looking forward to is, is so you mentioned ARM support. ARM support right now is, is, is technically experimental. And one of the things at least I'm looking forward to at least seeing is, is eventually getting it to be fully supported. And that's been an effort in the community. And, and all that means by fully supported is like having all of the CI test lane equivalent on x86 running on guess, ARM. So every patch runs you know, all these tests on both architectures. And, and, and that would be something that's nice that's been pushing for, for a while. And, and hopefully we can deliver on in, in, in 1.2. I would also add that um, I think in, the, in as a general trend, we're now trying to optimize everything and uh, re, uh, kind of reduce our footprint, um, um, uh, reduce our memory footprint. And uh, so I, I think in the next release, we'll see more optimizations, more uh, uh, performance, and, uh, and less, uh, uh, less memory footprint. Well, Vladik, well Vlad, Vladik and Ryan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very Thanks much for having us. us. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.